Welcome friends to another r slash pro revenge video. Today we've got some great stories of revenge and our first story of the day is from Bakatari. Military revenge served hot. Back in my army days I was once in command of a unit of about 80 soldiers in Hawaii. Most of the soldiers in my command were great people, happy to do their jobs and take home a paycheck. Hard workers, creative, adaptable to unusual army conditions, and generally reliable. But there was one who was trouble from the start. Gentle reader, meet Private Wiggles. My first awareness of Wiggles came two or three days after I'd taken over command of the unit. We're prepping for a month-long training exercise to Thailand, and Platoon Sergeant Maggie tells me Wiggles might not be able to go as she had just had an outpatient medical procedure. Departure is about a week away, and I have to validate the personnel roster to make sure we've got logistical support for everyone we're bringing. Transportation, food, lodging, etc. So I talk directly with Wiggles and ask if she's okay to travel and participate in the exercise. Wiggles says it's not a problem, she can handle it. We get to Thailand and set up camp on a Thai army base. Two days in, and the medical section sends a runner to find me. Wiggles is at our medical clinic, tents with cots and surprisingly extensive medical supplies, laid out with extreme abdominal pain. I cruise over to the clinic tent and the physician assistant on duty tells me a couple of things. Wiggles acknowledged recently having an abortion, the previously mentioned outpatient medical procedure, and the physician assistant's examination and testing shows that Wiggles has the single worst case of pelvic inflammatory disease he has ever seen. Seriously, this army PA who had seen all sorts of crazy stuff from soldiers was emphatically impressed by how bad it was. Wiggles developed PID from failing to get treatment for sexually transmitted infections for a long, long, long time. As in, she's almost glowing from it. No judgment on the overall procedure, not everyone's ready for kids. And the STI-induced PID can be treated with high-dose antibiotics which the PA has on hand, not a problem, we've got this covered. Wiggles is released to Sergeant Deb, her section sergeant, who will make sure Wiggles takes her antibiotics and keep an eye on her for any further issues. Sergeant Deb finds me and First Sergeant Bob about a day later and tells me two more things about Wiggles. She's refusing to take her antibiotics and she wants to get out of the army. I again talk with Wiggles and say, so you want out of the army? You know, you have a couple years left on your contract, right? She says, I know, but I'm just done being a soldier and I want to be out of the army. I say, okay, I can make that happen. You don't want to be here, then I don't want you here either. But here's the deal. You got to play by the rules. I can get you out with an honorable discharge and I'll start the paperwork as soon as we're back in Hawaii. But you need to take your antibiotics, do your job and be where you're supposed to be. You do your part and I'll do my part for you. Sound good? She says, yep, I can do that. Spoiler alert, she couldn't do that. For the rest of the Thailand exercise, Sergeant Deb had to take control of Wiggles' meds and force her to take them, when she could actually find Wiggles, who consistently found someplace else to be. At one point in the next week or so, she accuses First Sergeant Bob of having sex with her, easily disproven as he doesn't have any STIs and Wiggles has all of them. She was just trying to stir up trouble with wild accusations, I guess. We get back to Hawaii, and I start the process to get her out of the army. Because as much as she's been a handful of trouble in Thailand, I'm thinking it's still easier at this point to kick her to the curb than it is to keep her around and punish her before kicking her out. I was wrong. Even as I start to work on her discharge, she ramps up the stupidity. Here are a few examples. She gets caught drinking, only 19 years old. Wiggles and her husband lie to the on-base housing office and provide forged authorization documents to get into rent-free on-base housing that they didn't qualify for. Side note, Mr. Wiggles was no winner either. He was about to be dishonorably discharged from his infantry unit for selling drugs to other soldiers. Wiggles shows up at the infirmary to get treatment for facial bruising. Mr. Wiggles kicked her in the face while wearing his combat boots when Wiggles accused him of cheating on her. Wiggles refuses to show up for work or any unit formation and can't be found anywhere for days. Wiggles slashes all four tires on Mr. Wiggles' car, then attacks him with the knife when he confronts her. The military police are called, end up taking him in when Wiggles gives a sob story. 
but he's the one with defensive wounds on his hands, not her. One of my male sergeants uses my open door policy to visit me one day, tells me he saw Wiggle stripping at one of the skinkier gentlemen's clubs down in Honolulu the night before, and she had also convinced one of our other female soldiers to come along with her to do the same. Here's a weird one, I get a call from a temp agency asking me if it's okay for Wiggles to continue working through them as an administrative assistant for clients in town. Not uncommon for soldiers to have a second job, but with everything else she was up to at the time, this one just had me going, what the freak? There's more, but you get the idea. At this point, Wiggles' actions are egregious enough that I can no longer just kick her out with an honorable discharge. I put her on notice that she's at risk for a court-martial. I thought that threat might keep her in line, but she just couldn't seem to stop herself from getting stupider and stupider. It's the old 80-20 problem. 80% of your time is spent dealing with the 20% of your folks who are troublemakers. At this point, I'm wasting a not insignificant amount of time dealing with Wiggles issues almost daily. I had genuinely and in good faith offered her the easy path, but I guess she figured she'd try to burn the place down on the way out since she apparently thought she was getting what she wanted, no matter what she did. I was reminded of what my old platoon sergeant used to say when I was coming up through the ranks. You wanna get stupid? Go ahead. But I can get stupider. Cue the revenge. She's causing me daily headaches, so I'm going to bring the pain back to her. Honorable discharge paperwork is out the window, and I lean into the special court-martial process instead. My legal counsel tells me that Wiggle's activities are likely to get her a couple of weeks confinement at most. Maybe not even that. She may get a monetary fine, and she'll probably get an other than honorable discharge. Potential for a bad conduct discharge, which are worse. But while their actions have been not that good, they're also not that bad. I'm rational enough to understand that. I have a brief chat with Captain Morgan, Wiggles' military defense attorney about where I'm going with this case. During our chat, I try to be a gentleman and let him know that Wiggles is going to be trouble for him if he's not careful. He gives me a condescending, this isn't my first rodeo OP, I'm a big boy and can take care of myself. Fair enough, I try to warn you. Normally a soldier getting a special court martial for piddly stuff might get confined to the barracks, restricted to their on-base quarters or something similar for the duration of the process. It's not like she killed someone, right? However, my military legal counsel drops this little gem in my ear. He tells me Wiggles has met all five of the conditions, danger to others, flight risk, etc., required by military law, Uniform Code of Military Justice, UCMJ, to warrant requesting confinement prior to her trial. He tells me, if you can remember these five conditions and elaborate on the details at our next pre-trial meeting with the military magistrate, you might be able to get her confined to the Navy brig at Ford Island until the trial. I'm a guy who likes to pay attention to sound legal advice, so I do just as he says. A couple days later we go in for the pre-trial meeting and I run down the list for the magistrate. Boom! Magistrate orders Wiggles to be confined in the brig through the trial. First Sergeant Bob and Platoon Sergeant Maggie go to pick her up from her on-base housing. She won't open the door but they know she's inside because they can clearly hear her and Mr. Wiggles banging away. This is important for later. The Wiggles finish up, she takes her time getting showered and dressed and finally comes to the door when it pleases her. Off she goes to the brig. The pretrial processes take up the next four weeks. During that time, I have to deal with Captain Morgan, the paralegals in his office, and various fun things to do with her pending court martial. Other than that, it's blissfully peaceful. Wiggles chills in the brig for four weeks. Seriously, chills. Every time I had a visit, it was freezing in there. I was required to make weekly welfare visits to see if she was being mistreated, if she has any needs that aren't being met, etc. Seems weird, but as her commander, I'm still responsible to make sure the brig staff aren't mistreating my soldier. Other goings on in this time period, Mr. Wiggles fraudulently applies for a car loan and gets a van in their names. Mr. Wiggles is dishonorably discharged and kicked off the island, flies home to wherever the heck he originally enlisted from. Captain Morgan asks me to consider an other than honorable discharge and time served in lieu of taking things all the way to trial. 
I'm hot to get that pound of flesh from her, but my legal counsel advises me to avoid the court martial and just kick out Wiggles with an other than honorable discharge. After all, he says, she's already been locked up for almost three weeks, so the magistrate will probably just give her time served and the OTH anyway. See my earlier comment about sound legal advice? My boss, Lieutenant Colonel Ryan, thinks I'm too invested in the case and that I'm no longer objective. Lieutenant Colonel Ryan insists on coming with me to the brig for the next welfare visit. This is three weeks into Wiggles' stay in those luxurious accommodations. Among other BS lines she throws at us, Wiggles tells us she needs to see the dentist about a feeling that's giving her trouble, and Motrin just isn't working. At the end of the visit, Lieutenant Colonel Ryan tells the guards about Wiggles' filling, asks if they can give her anything stronger than Motrin, then instructs them to follow up with the dentist. The guard actually laughs out loud at this and says, No sir, Motrin is the best we can do in the brig, and that other thing? For the last two weeks she's been telling anyone with ears that she wants to try getting her wisdom teeth pulled before she's kicked out. She doesn't have a problem with any fillings. It was hilarious to watch Lt. Col. Ryan's face go from obvious concern for Wiggles' well-being to outright fury, and the next words out of his mouth were, That witch lied to me! I make arrangements with Captain Morgan to accept his request for time served and OTH in lieu of court-martial. Sometime later that week I get a call from the brig. Wiggles is pregnant. Remember the scene at her house four weeks prior? and they can't keep her confined anymore because of it. She has to be released back to her unit until the court-martial, or other actions, are complete. Captain Morgan stakes his reputation on Wiggles being a good girl until we can send her back home to Carolina. He'll come to regret that, and he can't say I didn't warn him. We get Wiggles back from her four-week, all-inclusive stay in the brig. I've accepted Captain Morgan's request to avoid the court-martial, and I can find Wiggles to the barracks under supervision for the nine days she has left until her flight to Carolina. Immediately we have another crap show. Wiggles is smoking in the barracks. Not a big deal that she's smoking, it's just not allowed inside barracks rooms. Wiggles is caught with a bottle of hypnotic liquor in her barracks room. She's still only 19. Wiggles slips out of the barracks and runs off for a day when her platoon sergeant gets distracted from supervising her. First Sergeant Bob and Lieutenant Ricky, the executive officer, go to collect Wiggles' belongings from her on-base housing so we can box it up and ship it to her home, and they find that Mr. Wiggles has left behind a bunch of stuff he stole from other soldiers. Body armor, military equipment, and some ammunition, smoke grenades, and explosives that he stole during trips to the range. All lined up right inside the front door where it's impossible to miss. They call me asking what to do. I say just collect it all, return the equipment to the central issue facility, and dump the ammo and explosives in the nearest amnesty box. Mr. Wiggles obviously meant for Wiggles to take the fall for having it. Husband of the year. If we take that bait, Wiggles will be here forever. I don't want that, do you? Lieutenant Ricky says, nope, I don't want that either. It'll be like it never happened. In light of all this drama, I bring Wiggles into my office to remind her of her agreement to be a good girl until she leaves the island, with Lieutenant Ricky as a witness in the office to protect my butt. I said, Wiggles, you're in violation of your release agreement from the brig. You've been sneaking out of the barracks, you've been smoking and drinking. She cuts me off and says, yeah, and doing all kinds of drugs too, in a heavy sarcasm voice. Be that as it may, I'm giving you a fair warning that you're at risk of losing the deal I made with Captain Morgan. Additionally, you're pregnant again. I'm not sure if you're aware of it, but most damage to a fetus from alcohol and smoking will come in the first few weeks after conception. I don't know if you're planning to keep this one or not, but at the rate you're going, this baby's going to be born dumber than you. Wiggles is silent, mouth gaping like a darn fish, finally picks her jaw up off the floor, Wiggles then bolts from my office and runs down to Lieutenant Colonel Ryan's office at the other end of the building to squeal on me for insulting her. Lieutenant Ricky hot on her heels. She tries to rush into Lieutenant Colonel Ryan's office, but Lieutenant Ricky gets in first and fills him in. Lieutenant Ricky later tells me how it went down. Wiggles is yelling about how I called her stupid, strangely vanilla thing to focus on, considering everything she's done, but you do you, and that she's being mistreated. Lieutenant Colonel Ryan yells at his admin to get Captain Morgan on the phone now. 
He reams Captain Morgan for his client's jack buttery, tells him to freaking fix this, and makes various threats to Captain Morgan's career. About a half hour later, I get a call from Captain Morgan. Captain Morgan says, OP, OP, OP. Yes, he did that whole patronizing BS. I can't believe the words I'm hearing from Wiggles. I'm shocked, just shocked, that you would use language like that and call her names. Side note, my mom's an attorney, and I grew up with tales from the courthouse about lawyers using exactly this sort of hyperbole. Your Honor, I'm shocked, appalled, and dismayed that the opposing counsel would attempt to paint my client in such a light. It's the kind of BS that they say when they don't have a good argument. So as soon as I hear the word shocked, I know I own him and immediately cut in. And I bet you're appalled and dismayed too. Captain Morgan, stumbling and sounding slightly confused, said, Well, yes, of course I am. You can't talk to soldiers like that. I know of a lieutenant colonel, a commander, who called one of her soldiers stupid and she's no longer in command now. I say I didn't call her stupid. I informed her of basic biological facts. Not my problem if she takes the news poorly, and arguably she's not all that smart. Anyway, you called me and I'm pretty sure it wasn't to warn me about what I said to Wiggles, so what do you want? They say, what will it take to prevent you from kicking back our deal? Apparently, Lieutenant Colonel Ryan had cinched his rear end up good and tight. I say, you could get her on a plane tomorrow. They say, how about if I get her out here by Friday? It was Wednesday and she was due to fly out the following Wednesday. I say, I don't think you can manage that, but good on you if you do. To his credit, Captain Morgan gets Wiggles a flight for Sunday, three days early. I print up official orders appointing Lieutenant Ricky as a military escort specifically for her. Lieutenant Ricky drives her to the airport, and the airline desk agent calls me to verify his status when they get to the check-in counter. They give him a special pass to get through security with her. He stays with her at the gate to make sure she gets on, and stays on, the plane, then stays at the gate until the plane's in the air. Some boogers are hard to flick. We wanted to make darn sure this one landed someplace else. About a month later, I get a call from the military police about a derelict van in the parking lot with all four tires slashed. Guess who that belonged to? It's really kind of sad when I look back on it. I had two other soldiers come to me at different points asking to get out of the army ahead of their contracts. One just didn't want to be in the army anymore. The other did want to stay in the army, but had family issues that would be a lot easier to deal with as a civilian. They played by the rules and I got both of them out with honorable discharges and all the benefits. They even qualified for unemployment. Too easy. Wiggles could have had the same treatment. I told her exactly what I could do for her, then had to shift gears and told her exactly what I was going to do to her, then I did it. I could have been her best friend on her way out the door, but instead, I ended up owning her and her dumb defense attorney. She screwed herself out of transition benefits and access to the VA and picked up a lifelong black mark for employment, all because she couldn't play nice for a few weeks. She decided she wanted to play screw around, screw around games, and we all know what happens next. Does anybody else agree with me when I say that honestly this story is a little sad to hear about? Like I feel like it's so clear that this person is just too far gone on addiction and probably a myriad of other mental health issues and despite multiple people trying their best to help them out, they can't help but just self-sabotage. Should you guys feel bad for Wiggles in this situation? I'd like to know what you guys think in the comments down below. Our next story is from Xbox Gamer 2122 Don't mess with my trash cans. My next door neighbor is one of those people who believes he's the mayor of the neighborhood. We live on a cul-de-sac with only seven houses. He'd berate people whose grass is taller than he feels it should be. He called the cops on me a few times if he could hear music playing outside, not loudly and even during the daytime. The town deputy who came each time finally measured the volume level with a phone app and told him that it was under 50 decibels and therefore permissible, and that he wouldn't come out again for the same complaint. The last straw for me was my garbage can, about four feet high with two wheels and a handle to move it up and down the driveway. It was put out every Wednesday night and the truck came early the next morning to empty it. The neighbor decided he didn't like where I placed it, I take mine out at night, and started moving it when he brought his own can out in the morning. It's a small thing but eventually I decided it needed to stop. I took a turd from my cat's litter box and smeared it on the inside of the handle of the garbage can. 
It faced away from the street with the handle on the street side. If you looked from the yard side, you could see little gobs on the inside of the handle, but from the street side, it looked normal. Usually I get up a couple of hours after the garbage truck comes by, but that day I was up early and watched from an upstairs window with a cup of coffee. Neighbor wheeled his can down to the end of his driveway, crossed the street, and started to move my can. As soon as he wrapped his fingers around the handle, he jerked his hands away, saw the brown goo on his fingers, and actually sniffed them. He then went totally ballistic, yelling obscenities I could hear from inside. Then he viciously booted my can into my yard, knocking out garbage bags, and then started kicking them which scattered trash all over my lawn. He then went inside and called the cops. The same deputy arrived about 15 minutes later and spent another 15 minutes trying to calm him down. The neighbor pointed to the handles of the garbage can and kept screaming, He put crap there and I got it on my hands! Eventually the deputy told the neighbor to stay put and walked across the street to my house. I was already waiting at the front door when he knocked. He addressed me by my first name since he had been called up before and said, Mr. Jones claims you rubbed feces on your garbage can and he got it on his hands when he attempted to move it from the street. I, of course, had rehearsed my reply and knew better than to deny the obvious. It's my garbage can and I can do whatever I want to it, right? Plus, it was on my property and he had no business touching it. The deputy was struggling to keep a straight face at this point, and I added, he also tossed trash all over my yard, and I shouldn't have to pick it up. The deputy nodded and said, yeah, he did admit to doing that. The deputy told me to stay on my porch and walked back across the street to the neighbor, who was already asking what was going to happen to me. I couldn't hear what was said, but the deputy eventually escorted him over to my yard and watched as the neighbor picked up the trash and put it all back into the garbage can that he had to stand back upright by grabbing the rim, not the handle. They went back to the neighbor's driveway, and the deputy quietly lectured him for a couple of minutes. I never had any issues with him again. I love this situation because what did the neighbor think the cop was going to do? Does he think their local laws have some kind of clause for intentionally smearing poo on a handle of a trash can? I mean, I guess I know in most places it's fair game once the trash is out at the curb, but it was like one degree away from just basically messing with the neighbor's stuff. Honestly, if anything, I feel like the neighbor should get a fine for abusing the police system. It's such a non-case. Our next story is from fan Shiel Mosterin. Embarrass my colleague? I'll embarrass you in front of all of yours. I'm a photographer and I've been contracting for a school photo company for a few months at the start of each school year for a while now. This company sends out two photographers who work as a team switching off each day, one for group class photos and the other on portraits. A few weeks ago, I was out at a school with one of my colleagues who's a highly competent photographer and makes a ton as one of our country's most sought after wedding photographers. Point is, she knows her stuff. We had a 9th grade special ed class, the class for kids with ADHD and the ones who struggle in school because of home life, not the class for developmentally disabled students, comes in with two teachers who both had bad attitudes, like photo day is a total inconvenience and not worthy of taking seriously, which sucks because it doesn't help the students enjoy it or cooperate. So my colleague was on group pictures and got their photo all set up, teachers rolling their eyes the whole time. Then when she started taking pictures, she says, say cheese, like she would with any other group. Different phrase, of course, in our language, but equivalent and as ubiquitous as cheese in the US. Well, the teachers, Martin and Helly, both immediately start chewing my colleague out for being patronizing and belittling, as they believe saying cheese is only for children. They felt insulted on behalf of their students, even. My colleague was crushed and embarrassed to be yelled at in front of the students. She's all in her head like, I've been having wedding parties say cheese for years. Have I been offending people? Well today, I got sent out to the same school to take a staff photo. I get every teacher in the school set and take the first picture and yell, say cheese, which the majority did with gusto, including those two. Then I said, oh no, I'm so sorry, I forgot. Martin and Helly don't like to say cheese. They're way too cool to say something so childish. Let's go with something more adult. Everyone say whiskey so Martin and Helly aren't embarrassed. 
those teachers get an array of looks, from deeply annoyed with them to simply puzzled. Martin and Helly look properly ashamed. Then the whole group yells, Whiskey so Martin and Helly aren't embarrassed. Usually if there's people embarrassed about doing something like that, it's not nice to call them out. But these people were such party poopers and making life and your job so just annoying. I think they deserved it. Just expose them as total party poopers in front of all of their peers. All of a sudden it doesn't seem so childish and inappropriate now, does it? Maybe they'll realize it's just human to have fun. Our next story is from Cubicle Man. Let your kid play phone games on full brightness at the movie theater? Have fun watching through my work boots. I watch the new Batman movie in the theater. Very, very rarely do I go to the theater. Lady sits next to me but sits her kid down on the chair next to me instead of herself. Wouldn't you want to be the buffer for a stranger? Anyways, she proceeds to let her kid play phone games with the brightness almost all the way up. Here's the kicker. This is an expensive theater. Nice bucket seats and a wall in front of each row of chairs so you can't see the people below you. A little bit about myself. If I'm in public, I'm wearing my Ariad work boots. Steel toe, large, has like a one inch heel. So, let the revenge ensue. My boots hit that partition wall and basically don't come down for the entire film. Boot on boot, crossed so they take up even more space. Literally probably one-fourth of her perspective was my boots the whole movie. I shook them back and forth as if waiting with anxiety. I went to the restroom and came back and didn't put my boots back up. Waited about three minutes, right when she was thinking, oh thank god he didn't put them back up. Boom, here's my boots. Okay, let's point out the obvious here. It is absolutely awful to have anybody in that theater doing anything on their phone with full brightness. But can we also point out that the new Batman movie is an extremely dark movie? Like, visually, 75% of the movie is in near pitch black conditions. It is like the worst possible movie for that kid to be playing phone games with that brightness up. So I don't blame OP at all. Honestly, you should probably just get up, go out, and find some kind of worker and tell them because they don't deserve to even stay in the theater if they're going to try to pull that. And our final story of the day is from KBF DJ LGS. Want to be a Karen? Fine. I'll waste your time. So at my old job where I was a secretary at a country club, this lady came up to the service desk. She was clearly pissed about something before she spoke, so I braced myself. She said she had opened up a new bank account and closed the other so she needed to give us the updated bank account info. I look her up in our system and see she's three months late on the automatic withdrawal payments and so had three months of late fees. I told her and she lost her mind. She screamed so loud all eyes in the lobby were on us with everyone looking at her in either shock, amusement, or disgust. The late fees amounted to $450 and she demanded they be removed. Now, if she had simply asked nicely, I would have told her I can ask my manager if the fees could be removed, but instead she called me a witch and a runt multiple times and called me a thief, insisting I was making up the late fees so I could pocket her money, whining about how she would need to wait a week to buy some purse if she paid it now. So after she calmed down a little, I told her I'll start the process to remove the fees and started typing really fast and loud. In reality, I did a series of free typing tests online. 85 words per minute was my top score. Not too bad, huh? 5 minutes go by, 10 minutes, 15, 20. At the 30 minute mark, she yells, forget it, and hands me her debit card to pay the fees. 85 words per minute is pretty solid. You definitely want to try to hit triple digits if you can. But I know your fingers got to be like really moving to hit those three digits. Honestly, those typing tests kind of give me anxiety because I'm afraid of just like missing one period and totally ruining my whole score, but I've done them for fun sometimes and I can definitely hit the low 100s. In all seriousness though, this Kieran was clearly very entitled, probably very spoiled. Oh, I can't go buy this purse. Inside, in my mind, I'd be like, I'm weeping for you, ma'am. Really, I am. I am so sorry for you. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. Now, if you want to hear another absolutely crazy revenge story, click on that left video. Or if you missed my latest video, check out the one on the right. That said, I'll see you all next time with some more stories.